Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Mental Architecture, Building the Mind One Moment at a Time. I'm Howard Blumenfeld and this, this channel is based off of my book by the same name, which you can check out on Amazon. Today's episode is going to focus on section three of chapter four, which is sensory gating. The chapter was originally named Object Identification and Representation, but I think a more appropriate title would actually be Sensory Gating. So what is sensory gating? We'll talk about that right now. Sensory gating is a phenomenon that you can observe in your everyday life with everything that you do. For example, if you're ever driving down a straight road and in your head you're focusing on something else, the road might seem a lot smoother than it really is. If you are in an airplane, the flight might seem smoother than it is, unless it gets like extremely bumpy. And if you're in a large lecture hall or auditorium and there's a bunch of background chatter going on, you might kind of tune some of that out. So your ability to tune out the details of something that's either visual, auditory, or another sensation that isn't directly relevant to the task at hand is known as sensory gating. So for instance, when you're driving, you can tune out the slight imperfections and bumps in the road. Obviously, if you're driving, you don't want to focus on those things because it would take your focus off the road. So there are some experiments that were done to test out how sensory gating works and explore a little bit deeper. So I want to talk to you about those. So a researcher by the name of Howard Cromwell interpreted sensory gating as a brain's way of preventing itself from getting overloaded by too much incoming sensory data. Like I was talking about before, if you were driving and you were to focus on all the little irrelevant details of the road, the way that the lines aren't perfectly straight or just everything passing by, your brain would get completely overloaded. You wouldn't be able to focus. So he designed a study for animal subjects to test out their sensory gating abilities. And what he did was really simple. He took two auditory clicks spaced out by 500 milliseconds. The first click and the second click were identical. And he looked in the animal's brain regions and discovered that in most cases, the attention to the first click was far greater than the attention given to the second click. And he devised something called a sensory gating ratio, where he took the amount of time of attention on the second click and divided it by the amount of time on the first click. And any time that there was like a really low ratio, that would be thought of as really good sensory gating. A high ratio would indicate that the sensory gating was not very good and the animals were focused on the second click for much longer than they probably should have been. Now the levels of sensory gating that animals showed depended highly on context. The researchers tried an experiment on rats where they gave them a very slight stressor and they found that sensory gating ability was enhanced, showing that the brain basically is able to strip everything away and just focus on the bare necessities during a flight or, uh, flight or fight response. Whereas in a more calm situation, the sensory gating ratio may have been a lot higher than in this case where the rats were under some kind of stress. Another group of researchers led by C.H. Chang wanted to determine if sensory gating in humans depended on whether it was modality dependent or modality independent. And what that simply means is did it depend on the kind of sensation, whether it was a sensation of vision, visual, or touch or a, a sensation of auditory hearing or gustatory tasting. So uh, did it depend on the type of sensation that the person was having? So for this study, they only recorded tactile and auditory sensations, and they used a device called an MEG, which is a magnetoencephalogram, to determine what was going on neurologically when certain, certain uh, stimuli were being conducted uh, towards these people. So for the first experiment, the subjects were situated in an MEG machine and they had a device placed on them that would cause one of their muscles to twitch. And what, basically this would happen with 500 millisecond intervals. So you'd have one stimulus delivered to twitch, 500 milliseconds later you have another twitch. But their goal was to try to ignore both times that they got zapped with this stimuli while they're watching a silent movie. In the second tactile task, they had their hands out and they had a device placed on their left hand on two of the fingers and they were told to ignore the stimulation on one of the fingers but pay attention to it on the other one and so on the on the finger that they had to pay attention to it on they were supposed to press a button with their right hand and then they were supposed to ignore the other one now this type of task where they have to press a button for one thing and ignore it for another is known 
in the literature as a go, no go task. And the researchers had them do an auditory one that was very similar where they presented the subjects with low pitch tones and high pitch tones. They were told to ignore the high pitch tones but then press a button for the low pitch tones and there were much more low pitch tones than there were high pitch tones. Now the researchers found no difference at all in the performance of the subjects between the tactile go-no-go -no -go task and the auditory go-no-go -no -go task. And they hypothesized that the reason for subjects doing so well, by the way, which they did on both of these tasks in terms of the sensory gating abilities was because they were primed ahead of time by that one that you know gave the little stimulation that made their muscles twitch. And they also found that sensory gating seemed to be modality independent, meaning it didn't matter whether it was auditory or tactile stimuli happening. It's important to know that this does not say anything about what causes sensory gating abilities to be so great, you know, in these two situations or what causes it to be modality independent. But it does, it does raise an interesting thing that sensory gating is pretty universal across the different senses. Although sensory gating occurs pretty much all throughout the brain in a variety of modalities, one of the neurotransmitters that's thought to be responsible for sensory gating behavior is GABA. And that is thought to be because GABA provides an inhibitory quality in the brain to stimuli. And it also would explain why as people get older, their ability to tune irrelevant details out or irrelevant data out becomes more difficult. So I've noticed as I've gotten older that it's been a little bit harder for me to tune things out around me and it takes more effort for me to focus on things. Sensory inhibition is the ability to filter out irrelevant details in your environment. So to basically intentionally try to block stuff out. Your brain is using sensory gating during this process in many cases. People who were highly intelligent, they're said to have high fluid intelligence, had strong abilities to filter out this irrelevant stuff. Whereas other people, and we're not saying these people weren't intelligent. This is when I say intelligence, I mean this measured by an IQ test. And we'll get into like intelligence in another chapter. But people who didn't have these abilities to filter out irrelevancies, uh, actually in many cases were able to remember things that happened that the people who had great sensory inhibition couldn't remember. So there may be some benefits to not being able to push out all the distractions in your environment. There are some people who focus more on distractions than others. And I'd like to actually get into the next two sections of my book. I feel like they tie really well into this one and there's really would be no point in doing two additional videos. So we're gonna look at section four and section five in this video. And then um, and you can see basically how lower sensory gating abilities can actually be a potentially beneficial in some situations. So the fourth section of chapter four is known as a link between distractibility and creativity and really just carries on the themes of the previous section by trying to focus on the positives of not being able to pay attention. Well, I don't think it's really not being able to pay attention so much as not being able to focus on certain things and ignore other stimuli. And we, we think of in our fast-paced, you know, career-driven, goal-driven um, environment that being able to block out so-called irrelevant stimuli is always a good thing, and if you can't do that, then that's harmful. But that's not always the case. As with anything, it's a lot more complicated than that. So I'd like to share a quote with you from researcher Daria Zabalina, who explored um, sensory gating in a, from a different perspective. And this is what she had to say about people who have difficulty paying attention and focusing. Leaky attention may help people integrate ideas that are outside the focus of attention into their current information processing, leading to creative thinking. What's interesting is that what Ms. Zavalina found is that people who are more creative actually have higher sensory gating ratios, which means that they, are, they have lower sensory gating abilities. So they are more distractible. And when she did further research, she found that there are some people who actually have the ability to do what's known as cognitive control, where they're able to switch on and switch off their ability to focus. So when they want to be creative, they switch off that focusing ability and they kind of 
space out a little bit and engage in more of their senses and they let the information come to them. And then when they need to, they switch that cognitive control switch back on. Not everybody has that abilities, in fact, um, or has those abilities. And in fact, some individuals with different forms of mental illness, such as schizophrenia or depression, have been found to have lower sensory gaining abilities and with or without necessarily creative benefits. So it's not always, it's not always a, a positive experience for the individual, but it certainly can be, and people can train themselves to switch on their cognitive control to focus more sharply or not focus. I guess there's a certain kind of uh, beauty to spacing out. That's where creativity happens. But then when you want to make those ideas happen, you have to kind of zone in and focus and ignore the irrelevancies that would otherwise be there to distract you. Now, here's where things get really interesting. So the next section of my book, section five, is the effects of nicotine administration on distractibility. And it answers the question of can smoking help you focus or nicotine help you focus? I'm in no way endorsing smoking, but just purely examining this from a scientific perspective and specifically smoking nicotine containing agents. So the nicotine receptors in the brain are what we're after here. And it turns out that there is some evidence to support that nicotine administration enhances sensory gaining abilities in people of all kinds. So people who have difficulty focusing, whether it be people with schizophrenia, depression, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, and so on. So let's, let's take a look at that. According to researcher Lee Wan, smoking may exert positive effects on attention by enhancing sensory gaining superior sensory gating has been found in chronic smokers. Researcher Wang conducted extensive studies into the relationship between attention performance and sensory gating and assumed that there would be an inverted relationship between the two. So meaning that if you had a lowered sensory gating ratio, then you would be expected to have a higher attentional performance. And if you had a higher sensory gating ratio, you would be expected to have a lower attentional performance. And so he, con he conducted a series of experiments to do this. He used Posner and Peterson's attention model, which was based off of the three dimensions of attention, which are alerting, orienting, and conflict. Now, the first of these stages, the alerting phase, is where the brain basically focuses its attention. So you're making the intentional decision to focus on something. The orienting stage is where different cues in the environment kind of tell you exactly what you're focusing your attention on. And then the conflict stage has to deal with how you resolve differences in interpretation of what you're trying to interpret. So the researchers designed an, a, a two tests for the subjects to work on to measure this proposed relationship between sensory gating and attention. The first was called an intention network test or an ANT. And then the second test was called a Stroop task. In the attention network test, the subject saw an array of five arrows, and they were asked to, after they saw that, there was a slight delay, and then they were asked to press either a left arrow key or a right arrow key to indicate the direction that the arrows were going in. The Stroop task was a very interesting one, one of my favorites in this whole book. Um, so the researchers showed the subjects a series of color words. So a word might be red, might be orange, purple, or yellow, and then that color word was shown in a different color than the name of the word. So red might be shown in blue, yellow might be shown in orange. And they had to correctly identify the word, even if it was, like I said, it was color incongruent, meaning the color didn't match up with, with the word that described it. And they also had to do a task where they saw a symbol and then afterwards had to identify the color of that symbol. Those were the two elements of this troop task. So the researchers organized their subjects into four groups, the two main groups. One of the groups was smokers and the other group was non-smokers. And within the group of smokers were low schizotypy and high schizotypy individuals. So schizotypy is basically a, a spectrum of personality based on disorganized and illogical thinking that can range anywhere from mild to more severe where you start to enter into uh, mental health disorders like schizophrenia, for instance. So there was a pretty broad spectrum of, to kind of analyze not only smoking versus non-smoking, but also 
how organized the person's thinking was from really disorganized to really organized. Researchers found a very significant correlation between high levels of smoking in the individuals that were considered a smoking group and sensory gating abilities. And for the, as far as the schizotype you went, they found that people who were more on the high schizotopy side had less sensory gating abilities as expected. But they didn't really find that much of a difference between low schizotypy and high schizotypy individuals. Whereas on the smokers, they did find a pretty shocking difference between low smokers and high smokers. And so researchers came to hypothesize that maybe this is why you see a lot of people who are on the schizotypy spectrum self-medicating with cigarettes and other nicotine products, because maybe it helps them focus better. And while again, I don't condone smoking, we can't judge people who do it. They might have good, very good reasons for smoking. It might help them to focus when any, any other methods might not help them as much. So sensory gating is a necessary skill to navigate through this world productively, but there are benefits to having low levels of sensory gating, especially if you can switch on or switch off your ability to pay attention and focus when you want to be creative versus when you need to really work on a project and get something done or just try to pay attention for purposes of investigative research or something like that. Many different reasons for why we should turn on and off our ability to attenuate. It's also important to acknowledge that not everybody has the same attenuation abilities. And this has some pretty strong implications for reforming education. We can't expect everyone to learn the same way. We can't judge people on their ability to focus. There's more to intelligence than that. And there's a whole entire world of people who are highly creative that can be discouraged by traditional education methods. So sensory gating is something that I feel should have more attention paid, paid to it, but not in a punitive sort of sense, where if you don't have high sensory gating abilities, you should be felt that you're not intelligent or something like that. People who can't focus very well can often be extremely intelligent. So thank you for joining me for another episode of Mental Architecture, Building the Mind One Moment at a Time. If you haven't done so already, I hope you'll go check out my book, which is on Amazon. And please be sure to like, subscribe, and comment below. Share this channel with everybody that you know. There's material in here that's relevant for everybody. So I hope everybody has a great rest of their week or weekend, depending on when you're watching this. And I look forward to bringing you my next video, which will talk about the psychology of advertising.